but at least I'll, I'll get it started. Okay. So here is a simple reaction scheme. A goes to B goes to C. And if this were to occur in a certain type of chemical reactor, those would be the governing equations, component balances for the system. One differential equation for A and one for B. Okay. We don't have an equation for C because this system is soon to be constant volume, constant density, and C would be redundant with, a, with an overall material balance, which has already been done even though you can't tell. So we just need balances for A and B. Okay? All right. So if you look at this equation, you can see this equation is um, linear. This, this set of equations is linear, right? Look at CA and CB. They appear linearly. So that's, that's good. And this is another example where we can generate the analytical solution of this problem. So it's a good way to test numerical methods because you can, if you, you know, if you, let me put it this way. If you solve a set of equations and you don't know what the solution is, you never know if the solution is good, right? Because you don't know what the answer is to begin with. So usually when you test a method to see if it's good, you want to test it on a problem like this where you can analytically compute the solution. You can compare the numerical solution to the analytical solution. So this equation is linear. That's good. That means we can compute the analytical solution if we want. Uh, it's it's non-homogeneous, right? This this equation's homogeneous, but this one's not because of the CAI thing. That's not CA or CB. That makes it non-homogeneous. Okay. So you know the trick. I taught you the trick. Because CA is a constant, you can convert it into a homogeneous differential equation system by introducing these so-called deviation variables, right? First thing you do is you set the derivatives equal to zero, and then you find the steady state values of CA and CB. You've, we've done this three or four times now. It shouldn't be ex new or exciting. Okay. Set these derivatives equal to zero. Find the steady state values of CA and CB, which we call CA bar and CB bar, and then define your equations for CA and CB in terms of the difference between CA and the steady state values. This is called a deviation. So if this value is zero, that means you're at the steady state. Okay. So it's a deviation away from steady state, so we call it deviation variable. Okay. So if we choose to rewrite our differential equations in terms of CA prime and CB prime, we already know this will make the problem homogeneous, which I prove here. I'm not, I don't even think I need to prove this anymore. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, and so that will get rid of the CA um, I part. Do you want me to go over this? People are, people are noncommittal. That's the thing I like about um, teaching is that once you get to class this size, you can get any answer you want. So if I, if I don't want to do this, I'll pose this question. Who wants me to do this? No one will say yes. And I'll say, obviously, there's no enthusiasm for that. If I want to do it, I'll say, who wants me not to do this? No one will say anything. So I'll say, obviously, you want me to. All right. I don't know what I want to do in this case. But it suffices to say, we've done this before, so let's not belabor it, that if we define in terms of these deviation variables and rewrite the equations for that, all we have to do, if you look at in a nutshell, if you, if you call this CA prime and CB prime, all you have to do is eliminate that term because that drops out and put a prime there and put a prime there and put a prime there and a prime there and a prime there. And it looks like this. It makes the problem homogeneous. Okay, we've done it before. That's fine. That's not the main point of the exercise. Just making sure that you know what I'm doing there. Okay. So there's our equations. Now they're homogeneous, which is nice. So we have, you can see, three parameters in this model, right? We have the two rate constants, K1 and K2. And we also have um, this volumetric flow rate divided by the volume. Um, what you'll learn is something having to do with the residence time of the reactor, you'll learn. So I'm just giving you those values, right? I'm just giving you the ratio of Q over V and a K1 and K2. And you notice I picked K1 and K2 to be a lot different, OK? Why is that? So the problem's stiff, because <laughs> I want to make a stiff problem to illustrate things. So if you look back at the reaction scheme, you can see A goes to B comparatively slowly, but B goes to C really quickly, because that rate constant for K2 is really large. OK? All right. So if you take these three values, Q over V, and plug it in right there and right there. Oh, is that right? No, sorry, right there and right there, and then plug in the K1 and K2 in these two equations, they'll look like this, right? Because this is just, that's minus 1 and that's minus 1, so that gives you minus 2. Um, 
that term is 1 right there. And then if you gather these two terms involving it's m minus 200 minus 1, that's minus 201. OK? All right. So when you start seeing that you see a little suspicious here, because that number 200 looks pretty big compared to the other numbers. And so I just rewrote this the same equation as on the previous page. So since the system is linear, we can explicitly com compute the eigenvalues for this problem, right? And so I took these two equations and put it in the typical vector form. So the first element is called y1, it's ca prime, and the next element is cb prime. And so that's the equation for ca prime, and that's the equation for cb prime. This equation only depends on ca. So that means the system is, uh, is lower triangular. That means the eigenvalues are the two diagonal elements, right? Minus 2 and minus 201. All right. Um, and so that's a big separation in time scale. It's a factor of 100, right? So, if, so the way to look at this system is it, have, it has two modes to it. It responds according to two different time scales. One of the time scales is super fast, right? That's like this term that decays really quickly to zero. And then there's a term that's much slower. OK? All right. So because the system is linear, we can explicitly compute the eigenvalues. We conclude, OK, this problem is really stiff. OK. Now, I'm, 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 just gonna, I'm not going to go through the details of this but I'm going to just give you the conclusions of what I've done here so that we can have time to do the evaluations. Um, so what I'm trying to do via this example is show you why an implicit method is so much better than an explicit method. Okay? And so what I've done here is on the next two slides, first of all, or actually there are more than two, I first of all applied the explicit Euler method to this. Okay? So there's my set of equations. And if you apply the explicit Euler method, it means you evaluate the right-hand side at n. You get that e set of equations there. OK? So those are your iterative equations. Now what I do is I go through, and because of the nature of the equations, I'm able to analytically, I'm able to do some analytical work. And I'm able to show, which I won't go through the details, that if you take the first equation there, you get something that looks like this, OK? It's, it's not hard to get there, but I won't go through the details, OK? All right. So it, it, you can kind of see that the nature of the solution is going to depend on h. <laughs> not kind of. You can clearly see this. OK. So if you see, I, I partition this up into two, three regimes. So if h is small enough, then this term is going to be positive. Sorry. Right. OK? Um, it'll be positive and less than 1. So I'm kind of looking what's in this power, right? Because if I want to know what n, the value at n is, I can compute that to the value at 0 according to this equation I derived here. And so if you look at this, you'll find if h is in this range, the system is well-behaved. What I mean by well-behaved, it doesn't oscillate. Because I kind of know. In fact, I know because I have the solution. Systems, which we haven't really covered in any detail, systems that have two real eigenvalues cannot oscillate. Okay? So I know the real solution is not oscillatory. So I'd like my numerical solution not to be oscillatory either. So I, you can show in this equation, if, if the step size is small enough, it's OK. okay? If the step size is between this range, the the os it'll oscillate, but the oscillations will decay. It's kind of like this problem here. It's like that. It's not good because the real solution doesn't oscillate. Real solution looks something like that. So if it's in the second range, it's this. But if it's in the third range, way too big, it, the, the oscillations actually grow, which is, which is bad. Right? All right. So that says whether or not this method works depends on the value of h. And a priori, I don't know what h I should pick. So that's not good. That's number one. Okay. If you do the same thing for the second equation, you get even, I'm not going to go through it, you get an even worse result. It's the same thing, except now the range where h works is really small. Remember, it used to be h had to be between 0 and 1 half. Now it needs to be between h and 1 over 201. So we would say this method is conditionally stable. That means it works if h is small enough, and you don't know how small h should be. And in reality, because the system is stiff, h has to be really small. 
And my, my, my guess would be if you tried to do this on MATLAB, you, tried to do it, you'll, you would never try an H this small <laughs> and you would never think it works, okay? You can do the same thing if you do an um, implicit Euler, which means you evaluate the right-hand side at n plus 1 instead of n. And in that case, you get different looking equations, but the, the upshot of it is that you can show the solution is well behaved, in other words, doesn't oscillate and is stable for any value of h, okay? So this is really what you want because um, you would like to not have the solutions depend so strongly on the value of h, okay? So I won't go through the details here, but while the other one had to have a really small value of h to work, this thing works for no matter what the value of h. That's much better, much preferable, okay? So this was just one of many things you could do to try to show that these methods, if the problem is stiff, these methods are better than these methods, okay? All right. So with that in mind, bingo. Okay. So, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the evaluations. I already have a volunteer to bring them, okay? So here's what I'm looking for. I mean, obviously, you can write whatever you want. It's fine. Um, but anything, and I do read these, and I do modify the class accordingly. So it maybe not help you, but it could help you in the control class, which I'll probably teach. But you can comment on things you liked that worked well, things you thought didn't work well. If you like the book, you like the lecture notes. Some people get mad I use PowerPoint. Some people love I use PowerPoint. It just depends. Um, if you like the homeworks, project, any, anything you want. But if you, if you could um, focus on things that I could use to improve the class, because I don't really look at the numerical scores too much, because I mean, they are what they are. Um, but I look a lot at the written comments. So if you can take a few minutes to write comments about things you liked and didn't like, that would be great. So you're going to administer these, right? Can you, I have to go because I don't want to pressure you guys. I, I do know where you live, though. Oh, anyway. Um, so could you write the code on the board? Could you, can you use the code thing? It's up there. Okay. You can,